Please be seated. Thank you. Well, good morning. Now, on Thursday, you took an oath as a prospective juror to answer questions truthfully. Now that you've been selected to serve on the jury, there's a different oath that I must swear you all to. So if you'd raise your right hand, do you and each of you solemnly swear that you will well and truly try the issues herein joined and a true verdict render according to law and evidence, so help you God. Amen. Thank you. You may put your hand down. Now, this is the case of the state of Missouri versus Nicholas Godejan. Is the state ready to proceed? Yes, Your Honor. Is the defense? Yes, Judge, and we would ask the court to invoke the rule on witnesses. The rule on witnesses is invoked. Both sides will be responsible for their own witnesses. Now, ladies and gentlemen, I have several instructions I'm going to read to you, but let me tell you a couple little courtroom things. We'll take a break about every hour to an hour and 15 minutes. If you need a break before that, just raise your hand and let me know, and we'll take a break. I don't want to make anyone to be uncomfortable. If you can't hear or see uh, things that may be up on the screen, let us know. Just raise your hand, and we'll make sure that we turn it up or... We move people around so that you're able to see. There is no note-taking during this trial, and the court reporter will be unable to read back to you any portion of the trial during your deliberations. So it's very important that you pay attention to what the witnesses are saying. All right. Now, the case will proceed in the following order. First, the court will read to you two instructions concerning the law applicable to this case and its trial. Next, the attorney for the state must make an opening statement outlining what the attorney expects the state's evidence will be. The attorney for the defendant is not required to make an opening statement then or at any other time. However, if the attorney chooses to do so, he may make an opening statement after that of the state, or the attorney may reserve his opening statement until the conclusion of the state's evidence. Evidence will then be introduced. At the conclusion of all of the evidence, further instructions in writing concerning the law will be read to you by the court, after which the attorneys may make their arguments. You will then be given the written instructions of the court to take with you to your jury room. You will go to that room, select a four-person, deliberate, and arrive at your verdict. If you find the defendant guilty in this first stage of the trial, a second stage of the trial will be held. During the second stage, additional instructions will be read to you by the court Additional evidence may be presented, and the attorneys will make their arguments as to punishment. With the additional instructions of the court, you will return to the jury room, deliberate, and determine the punishment to be assessed. Sometimes there are delays or conferences out of your hearing with the attorneys about matters of law. There are good reasons for these delays and conferences. The court is confident that you will be patient and understanding. We will have recesses from time to time. The following two instructions of law are for your guidance in this case. The two of them, along with other instructions in writing, read to you at the close of all the evidence, will be handed to you at that time to take to your jury room. Instruction number one. Those who participate in a jury trial must do so in accordance with established rules. This is true of the parties, the witnesses, the lawyers, and the judge. It is equally true of jurors. It is the court's duty to enforce these rules and to instruct you upon the law applicable to the case. 
It is your duty to follow the law as the court gives it to you. However, no statement, ruling, or remark that I may make during the trial is intended to indicate my opinion of what the facts are. It is your duty to determine the facts and to determine them only from the evidence and the reasonable inferences to be drawn from the evidence. In your determination of the facts, you alone must decide upon the believability of the witnesses and the weight and value of the evidence. In determining the believability of a witness and the weight to be given to testimony of the witness, you may take into consideration the witness's manner while testifying, the ability and opportunity of the witness to observe and remember any matter about which testimony is given, any interest, bias, or prejudice the witness may have, the reasonableness of the witness's testimony considered in the light of all of the evidence in the case, and any other matters that has a tendency in reason to prove or disprove the truthfulness of the testimony of the witness. It is important for you to understand that this case must be decided only by the evidence presented in the proceedings in this courtroom and the instructions I give you. The reason for this is that the evidence presented in court is reviewed by the lawyers and the court, and the lawyers have the opportunity to comment on or dispute evidence presented in court. If you obtain information from other places, the lawyers do not have the opportunity to comment on or dispute it. Fairness in our system of justice require giving both sides the opportunity to view and comment on all evidence in the case. It is unfair to the parties if you obtain information about the case outside this courtroom. Therefore, you should not visit the scene of any of the incidents described in this case, nor should you conduct your own research or investigation. For example, you should not conduct any independent research of any type by reference to textbooks, dictionaries, magazines, the Internet, a person you consider to be knowledgeable, or any other means about any issue in this case, or any witnesses, parties, lawyers, medical or scientific terminology, or evidence that is any way involved in this trial. You should not communicate, use a cell phone, record, photograph, video, email, blog, tweet, text, or post anything about this trial or your thoughts or opinions about any issue in this case to any person. This prohibition on communication about this trial includes use of the Internet, Facebook, MySpace, Twitter, or any other personal or public website. Faithful performance by you of your duties as jurors is vital to the administration of justice. You should perform your duties without prejudice or fear and solely from a fair and impartial consideration of the whole case. An individual juror's personal bias, prejudice, or opinion about any characteristics or perceived <coughs> characteristics associated with disability, gender, nationality, race or ethnicity, religion, gender identity, or sexual orientation should not be considered. Do not make up your mind during the trial about what the verdict should be. Keep an open mind until you have heard all the evidence and the case is given to you to decide. Instruction number two. You must not assume as true any fact solely because it is included in or suggested by a question asked a witness. 
A question is not evidence and may be considered only as it supplies meaning to the answer. From time to time, the attorneys may make objections. They have a right to do so and are only doing their duty as they see it. You should draw no inference from the fact that an objection has been made. If the court sustains an objection to a question, you will disregard the entire question, and you should not speculate as to what the answer of the witness might have been. The same applies to exhibits offered but excluded from the evidence after an objection has been sustained. You will also disregard any answer or other matter which the court directs you not to consider, and anything which the court orders stricken from the record. The opening statements of attorneys are not evidence. Also, you must not consider as evidence any statement or remark or argument by any of the attorneys addressed to another attorney or to the court. However, the attorneys may enter into stipulations of fact. These stipulations become part of the evidence and are to be considered by you as such.